Today I'll be covering the Alabasta arc, manga chapters 155 to 217 and anime episodes 92 to 130, making it the longest one so far and one of my favorite arcs of all One Piece till this day. As they're finally approaching Alabasta, Vivi explains that Sir Crocodile is not really in the shadows here, but he's currently a hero. He gets rid of the other pirates and people don't care if the pirates are chased away by the navy or by one of the seven warlords of the seas, as long as the threat is eliminated. So this guy is saving the people from something that he caused himself, not a single bit of remorse or guilt, on the contrary, he clearly seems to like manipulating people. But I gotta say, I absolutely love his design since the first time I saw it. His face scar, his fancy clothes, his hair, his golden hook and earring, which give you more of a classic pirate vibe. But how can you not be hot wearing all that in this country though? Well, back to the straw hat. Before arriving, they suddenly encounter none other than Mr. Two. And this wasn't exactly the interaction that I was expecting at all. Certainly, Mr. Two's powers are something very dangerous to be in control of. And he used them in all of them except Vivi and Sanji. And these guys just met for five minutes and are already best friends. Well, it was all fun and games until they discover his true identity. And oh my god, Vivi, where were all your brain cells that you couldn't identify him? She was like, I never met him before. All I knew is that he wears makeup, talks like a girl, and wears a swan coat that says all come away on the back. Uh, excuse me, are you blind? But Sora's idea, of all people, to deal with Mr. Two in the future was a great way to reaffirm their fellowship and officially start this arc. As they step foot in Arabasta, two characters that we knew were going to be here are shown right away. And what a chaotic way of them meeting each other. Ace turned out to be Luffy's older brother. What the hell? I was really surprised to learn that Luffy has a brother. Fair enough, we don't know anything about his past or family since the only flashback we have is the one with Shanks. So I assumed he had no family. Luffy, as soon as he saw Smoker, tried to run away. He knows his attacks don't work on him, but this time it was Ace the one that gave him a hand. And he's a devil fruit user too, with the power of controlling fire. Smokey really can't catch a break with his family. Ace is also a pirate, but unlike Luffy, he's not the captain. He's the second division commander of Whitebeard's pirates, and his full name is Portugas D. Ace. Another one with a D, and the mystery continues. Ace is very committed to making Whitebeard king of the pirates, so that means he and Luffy are going after the same goal, kind of. As it happens, this Blackbeard guy that he was after used to belong to Whitebeard's 2nd Division, so he was under his command. But he committed the worst possible crime. He killed another shipmate and ran away. Therefore, Ace feels responsible, so that's why he's looking for him. And before leaving, he gave Luffy something very interesting. A piece of paper. Oh, I see, I see. Thanks? Yeah, it doesn't look like something very important, but Ace told him to always hang on to it and that it will bring them together again. So he had Nami suit inside of his headband and now that hat is even more valuable, even though we don't know what it means. I love the part when Ace tells the crew that he knows Luffy can sometimes give you a lot of grief, so he asked all of them to take care of him. Such a nice and cool big brother. And it was fun to see how everyone was surprised, including me, by him being nothing like Luffy in the sense of being so smart and calm. And I think everyone kind of loved him. Ace gave me like a weird first impression. Yes, he seems more reasonable than Luffy, even though he fell asleep while eating, but he still had a more of a serious and composed personality. But to me, he didn't have the biggest impact ever. He was just okay. I liked him. Maybe he was a little boring even, despite the fact that he was pretty badass. Or maybe I'm just too used to Luffy and everyone being all over the place. So in the end, I wouldn't say that Ace is a character that I was absolutely crazy about or that I can't wait to see again. And also his style didn't particularly catch my attention either, especially the back tattoo. Nah. But I gotta admit his surfing vehicle was really awesome. He reminded me of Hawkeye in his little boat being simply superior and destroying everything in his way. Well, Ace is gone and now they're headed to Yuba, so Bibi can speak with the rebel's leader. And the first thing they meet is this adorable little kung fu seal turtle, who became Luffy's apprentice after he beat him and he got more of his friends to join the training. And I love them so much that I just had to mention them. 
Before starting their way to Yuva though, the city they are currently at used to be the green city of Erumalu, but because crocodiles stole the rain from that region with an illegal powder and framed the king for it, is why a lot of people from this kingdom started increasing their anger and distrust towards the royal family, making us start to understand Vivi's despair more and more each time, and thus making Luffy and the rest have this increasing urge to give this man what he deserves. They immerse themselves completely into the depths of the desert, and now we're getting the full Alabasta vibes. Poor Chopper, I cannot look. He comes from a snowy winter island, and now he has to go through basically hell for him. Most drastic change ever for his first island away from home. Feel you, Chopper. I can't stand heat either. But Sora pulling on him though is the best part, and telling him that if he turns big, he's not gonna do it anymore. Yes, dad. But in reality, everyone is dying except for Vivi, and I don't know why I like those little details so much. When they finally arrive, arrive at Yuva is nothing like they were expecting. It's all covered in sand and there is no water and the rebels were not even here anymore. Great, just great. In her backstory, we can see that Vivi has never been your typical princess. She and her father don't care about status, they care about the people, which is actually not always a case for royals and maybe rare even. She got into a fight and made friends with a kid named Kosa, a boy who fights for his ideals and the people he cares about, even if that means defying the king. We can see where this is going. One day, when Vivi almost got kidnapped, Kosa defended her with his life, but not because she was the princess, but simply because she was his friend and would never let anyone hurt her. Aww. But Vivi didn't like the fact that her friends were putting their lives at risk for the sake of her. These two kids are just too precious. They really care about each other, never minding their social status. Koza tells Vivi that they are going to build a great city, so she has to become a great princess too. Okay, I see a ship here. They totally need to get married and rule together. And that brings us to the present time, where it hasn't rained in three years in Yuba. And the city is totally abandoned and Koza is ready for war. Not exactly the ideal outcome for this cute little goodbye. Fine, let's add a little more drama to the love story. But oh my god, get rid of those sunglasses right now. They're hideous. I'm serious. This next part confuses me a little. When Vivi sees old Toto crying, she says to him, don't worry, I'm going to stop the rebellion with the biggest smile on her face. But all the straw hats gave her a skeptical look. Wasn't this the plan all along? Or by seeing the situation in Yuba, they're starting to realize that maybe Vivi is being too unrealistic. And this is not something you can simply put a stop to. I really enjoy the pillow fight though. It's that expression that, again, helps her feel a little more at ease and realize how much he has grown to like these people. But the next day before returning and going all the way back to stop the rebels again, Luffy and Vivi have a fight, with Luffy even punching Vivi to wake her up. Luffy thinks that stopping the rebels isn't going to stop Crocodile, and as pirates, they shouldn't even show up where they are. Well, that actually makes sense. He tells Vivi that she's being naive and expecting to end this without blood being shed when everyone is itching to fight is not realistic. I love that this is the opposite from Drum Island, where she showed him that violence wasn't the solution there, and here he showed her that trying to solve everything peacefully is not gonna work, especially with one of the seven warlords of the seas involved, and that she can't just do everything by herself, so Luffy's basically telling her, we are here too, let us help you, and that they are her friends, and she doesn't have to put up a strong face all the time, it is okay for a princess to cry too. Oh my god, it's the Arlong Parhat moment all over again. And these moments, I feel, they're so well written that push your buttons in the perfect timing just to refresh your excitement over and over again. Okay, now where do we find this crocodile? Good question. Barack Wars were having a meeting where Crocodile informs everyone that Operation Utopia is about to begin, and that his goal is not money or status, but he wants military might, and that the true goal of Baroque Works is to get something that is in this kingdom. But someone barges into the scene, someone that was not dead after all. He tells them all that the Straw Hats are not dead, and that they are here in Alabasta with the princess. So Crocodile was really fooled by Sanji back then, maybe he's not that smart after all. And then Mr. Mr. 2 now realizes that he met these guys too. Crocodile orders everyone to be alert and that it's very important that Koza and Bibi do not meet because he knows they were childhood friends and that it could ruin everything. See, it really feels like a forbidden love story and he's gonna stand in their way like a Disney villain. And I love this little map, thank you. I'm sorry, but I'm not an expert on the Alabasta geography, so I kinda needed this. 
On the way to Rainbase, Vivi thanks Luffy for what he said before, and he only replies by saying, thank me with a feast when all of this is over. And that's just a nice little promise to look forward to as well. Now they arrived at Rainbase, they came by themselves right at his doorstep and right into the trap, Smoker included. I mean, I don't know what I was expecting, to be honest, but it wasn't this. And another thing that I love about One Piece is that it always surprises me. And a million things that I never thought could happen, happen. And it's so fun to watch because of that. They are not trapped in a normal cage either. This one is made out of something called Sea Prism Stone, which emits an energy identical to the oceans. So it's used against Devil Fruit users. The bars in the gels from the navy are made out of this thing as well, same as the tip of the weapon that Smokey uses, so that's why he cannot escape, otherwise it would have been a piece of cake. Outside we have Vivi being rescued by Pell, one of the first ranked royal guards, who has a devil fruit that can turn him into a falcon, one of the only five flying devil fruits known to exist. See, I would have never remembered that from my first watch. He looks really cool, I really like his design, and it's so nice to see Vivi being reunited with someone she knows. But she's not completely safe. Miss All Sunday shows up at the scene and why does she enjoy Vivi's suffering so much? She's a bitch, really. But now we finally know what her devil fruit is. And this is one of my favorite fruits I've seen so far. And I think it's one of the most useful ones too. She's savage. She can fight without even having to get her hands dirty. You know what I mean. So much for Alabasta's greatest warrior. Wow. Meanwhile, Crocodile is waiting for the guest of honor. Sure, Vivi, you, you can win. I believe in you. What is even that attack thing? Has she ever hurt anyone with that before? Well, we saw it before, but Crocodile is a sand man, which makes it incredibly appropriate for the land he wants to conquer. Coincidence? Apart from turning into sand at will, which is gonna be really hard to fight, kind of similar to fighting smoke, he can also take the water in people's bodies and can dry them up to death. Not gonna be easy. They continue to torture Vivi, telling her that basically all the people from this kingdom are just deceived fools and that that eventually will result in the destruction of Aravasta in the hands of its own citizens while thinking they were defending it. He's just inhuman, but I can't see myself hating him 100%. I kind of respect him somehow. He's interesting at least. I mean, I hate him. He's the worst. I want Luffy to destroy that impeccable facade he puts up like Captain Kuro fancy pirate. What I mean is that he's an entertaining and charismatic villain and I love his laugh. And of course he was also behind Yuba getting repeated sandstorms. Luffy's blood is boiling. Now Vivi just needs to get a key from an aquarium full of crocodiles, oh sorry, banana gators, and we are good to go. So Vivi, we're kind of waiting here if you don't mind. And to make matters worse, the room is gonna start filling up with water soon, killing them all. Like, okay, how's she actually going to save them? But is Mr. Prince to the rescue? Why do I keep forgetting about Sanji? It's like, you like code names? Well, we can play that game too. But why Mr. Prince? Is it because he said before that he was like a prince charming, always protecting Nami and Vivi? And I love that all those particular moments of Sanji not being there in Whiskey Peak, Little Garden, and when Mr. Two showed up in their ship was in the end for them to not know about his existence at all. Sanji and Chopper had a whole plan ready to fool Crocodile. And truth is, I've never been so happy to see you, Sanji. And what a great way to make an entrance to. They find an interesting surprise inside one of the beasts. It's Mr. Three again. Dude, this guy never dies. And he's still making trouble. Well, Sanji, thank you. And they force him to make a wax key. So smart. This part was so epic. Sanji, you really outdid yourself here. Right now, all my love to you. But they didn't get out that easily. Actually, they almost drowned. And Soro saved Smoker from a certain death under Luffy's orders. Smokey, I can, I can hear your internal conflict. His duty is to capture pirates, but he knows he wouldn't be doing the right thing by doing so here. One, because they are actually up to something good for this country. And two, because they saved his life. And Luffy didn't even expect for him to let them go. He was ready for a fight. He just wasn't gonna let him drown. And I love that before leaving, after Smoker gave them a one-time free pass, Luffy said, I kinda like you. Okay, fine, bye. I know Luffy, me too. Okay, what's the plan now? I knew Chopper's ability was gonna be useful. Now they have a ride to the capital. But Crocodile is still here trying to kidnap Vivi. Until Luffy traded places with her and asked everyone to just leave him behind. So he can finally deal with him. And that's what he was waiting for this whole time. 
everyone does as he says, and not only because he's the captain, but because everyone has blinding faith in him. Or maybe more like they simply have to trust that he'll be okay. Sora says to Vivi that she has to survive because she's the only one who can do something about this kingdom's fate. And that includes going forward no matter what happens to the rest of them. But I feel like this is the same situation as when she was a kid and everyone else was defending her with their lives and she never wanted that. So I prefer what Sanji said to her about how she's not fighting alone anymore. So instead of thinking they're all sacrificing themselves for her, she decides to believe in Luffy, leaving him behind but telling him that she'll be waiting for him in Alubarna, finally showing her full support. And now this is it, Luffy versus Crocodile, the big battle is here. Luffy tells Crocodile that Vivi's strength isn't in her muscles, but in her heart. But since she doesn't have the physical strength to win against him, he's gonna do it for her. And he used all his arsenal, no time to waste. Crocodile has some good moves as well. He said he's worked hard to improve his devil fruit powers and is always perfecting and developing them. See, this is why I like him. He's not like his idiot minions who are satisfied with theirs and already think they are invincible, even though he's kind of underestimating Luffy because Luffy never brags about his powers or strength and he's still carrying the water that the old man gave him, showing his appreciation, telling Crocodile that Yuba won't lose to the sand. But unfortunately, no one has a chance against him in the desert battle. He lost. Luffy actually lost. Didn't hit him a single time. Not even all the determination in the world can win if you're simply weaker. And oh my god, please stop this. This poor guy again, you soulless monster. Not only did Luffy lose, he would have actually died if it weren't for Miss All Sunday of all people. Okay, she's always been sus and she's clearly playing her own game here. Even Crocodile said that she's a mystery to him. And he called her by her real name, Nico Robin, which apparently she doesn't like to be called by. After saving Luffy, she asked him a question. Why do you fight as one of those whose name is D? So she's interested in the meaning behind this wheel as well. But seeing that Luffy has no idea what she's talking about, she decided to retire. She seems to have been interested in Luffy from the start, maybe because of his name, because she tried to help them by giving them an eternal pose back then and she didn't tell Baroque Works about Sanji's existence, so what's her real objective? On the other side, the gang was about to reach the capital, and I really really like the plan they came up with. Using the supersonic dog squad, they decided to split up and trick the enemy into not knowing which one Vivi was. And the best part was, Vivi was in none of them. And thanks to this, she finally managed to reach the gate in front of the rebels. And maybe this could have been a different story, but of course Baroque Works infiltrated the royal army and successfully prevented Vivi and Kosa from meeting. This was stressing me out so much. So close for the happily ever after. But if there's one thing that Vivi learned from the Straw Hats, is to never give up. She's the definition of getting up more times than you get knocked down. Usopp showed up here and tried to help her, but after saying forget that bird, it's a goner, she started doubting him. Come on Vivi, that gave it right away. You shouldn't even have had the need to use your secret code. Which also wasn't what everyone was expecting, right? Zoro, since when are you so smart? But Karu is the real MVP here. He shielded Vivi, ran away while being hurt, climbed a freaking wall, flew for two seconds, got shot, and still managed to get her inside the city safe and sound. While Vivi goes to the palace, the Straw Hats and the agents' fights have been decided. Okay, fight number one. Chopper and Usopp versus Mr. Four and Miss Merry Christmas. A really crazy one for sure. We have a mole woman and a guy who uses a gun that ate a dog devil fruit that fires time bomb balls that he directs with his bat. I don't know how Oda comes up with these things really. Mr. Four doesn't have a devil fruit but he's incredibly strong. They move through the holes and have a complete range of attack. Chopper and Usopp need to think quickly how to counter them. And Usopp, like usual, had a trick under his sleeve and took out a 5 ton hammer. It's just the confidence with which he pulls these things off, really. He's so full of shit, but it's an art. And the mole game, I was laughing so hard. Okay, time to get serious. Chopper managed to find one of their weaknesses and used the dog to put a bomb inside the holes, which are all connected. But seeing that they still got up after that, Usopp didn't think they could win, so he started running away. Classic Usopp. 
But when the mole lady insulted Luffy and his dream is when Usopp decided that he had to fight. Because there comes a time when a man has to fight an enemy, even if he's scared to death, and there's no chance of winning, and that time is when someone makes fun of your friend's dream. Respect. Respect. But ouch. Again, Usopp taking some pretty bad hits. This was way too much. Come on, how can you still be alive after all that? It hurts. It physically hurts. Somehow he came up with a plan, and after teaming up with Chopper's awesome transformation, Horn Boost, they got both of them direct, unrecoverable hits, and they managed to win the battle of the Southeast Gate. Fight number two, Sanji versus Bong Clay. I was looking forward to seeing a Sanji fight, and this is an interesting combination since they both have a similar fighting style. They kept going at it with their feet and yelling French words, but the swan is really strong, Sanji's actually having trouble, especially when Mr. Two pulled a really dirty trick. Sanji, you're so easily read. Well, I can see his struggle. I didn't particularly enjoy this part, but he managed to find a weakness in his strategy. He can't use his attacks while being transformed. But he still has one final form, the Prima Valerina, with a female swan on the right and a male on the left. My god, Sanji really had a tough time. Not for anything, he was the second strongest agent. And their fighting styles are practically the same. But in the end, of course Sanji was the last man standing. But somehow they ended up respecting each other. Kind of? And Sanji taking back Usopp's goggles was so sweet. Okay, fight number three, Nami versus Miss Doublefinger. My favorite battle from this arc. Nami sometime before asked Usopp to build her weapon. She knows she's not a fighter, but she has to be prepared for a potential fight anyways, and doesn't want to be a burden to anyone. But her enemy ended up being the most powerful woman left from Baroque works, the human spike. Nami goes like, okay, I'll fight you alright, and I might even win. That's the spirit. I was so nervous about this. So her new weapon is the climate baton. Love it. It's like the new version of the stick she used to use, but now with weather powers. And I couldn't stop laughing for the whole magic presentation. Even Miss Dolphinger was just patiently waiting to see what she was gonna pull. At first. And the spiky woman powers are kind of cool too. She even turned into Sonic at some point. Nami's just doing the impossible to try to run away from her while she's figuring this thing out. That long-nosed idiot, I'm gonna curse him from the grave. Like, really, my admiration for Nami. She was learning how to use a new weapon right then and there and managed to use everything Usopp incorporated that he was only thinking as party tricks but that in reality ended up creating a perfect weapon for her climate knowledge. And this lady has like a million forms. What in the world is that? I love that she praised Nami's dodging ability though. Don't underestimate a pirate thief. And here we have it, Nami's brand new final attack. Thunderbolt Tempo. But of course it's not over. And that actually hurts to watch. But the fact that Nami was thinking that this pain is nothing compared to what Vivi has suffered, and is that what helps her push through, is how devoted everyone is. She ultimately gives her the final blow, Tornado Tempo. Wait, that actually had me fooled for a second, I almost had a heart attack. She did it, she actually did it. Not gonna lie, at the beginning of the fight, I kinda thought that she was just gonna hang in there as much as she could, and then eventually someone was gonna come and help her. But she won! She defeated the number one ranked Baroque Works agent. Nami, you freaking rule. Time for the final fight for the crew members. Zoro versus Mr. One. Actually, this fight is the most interesting one for sure, and with the biggest development. Zoro has to fight a literal sword man. He knows in his current state he can't defeat him, but he's grateful. He has been waiting for an opportunity like this of being driven into a corner so he can surpass his limits and after this fight he will be a man who can cut through steel. Mr. One's power is similar to that of his partner. Every part of his body can be lethal. He can create spinning blades or simply scratch someone with fingers as knives. It's actually one of the coolest devil fruits. They have been showing some pretty good ones in this arc. And Zoro seemed like he actually stood no chance. But 
he remembers something his sensei back then told him. A sword can be able to cut nothing or have the ability to even cut steel. And achieving that is the pinnacle of swordsmanship, the power to protect what one wishes to protect and to cut what one wishes to cut. A blade that simply injures everything it touches is not really a sword. It's like a little similar to what Zoro experienced when he first used the Kitetsu. So I'm not really sure what happened here, but before all that rubble fell on him, he was wondering if the other ones were okay. And he reached a state where he was completely aware of his surroundings, realizing that everything has something alive in them. Everything has a breathing, and now he could hear what was silent for him before. And his sword can now understand his will. He used only one sword, Quina's sword, to take his one chance bet to finish this, thanking Mr. One at the end for allowing him to become stronger. No words. And he's still so worried about the others, how can you not love him? I just love that everyone had to fight. And yeah, Luffy's the one entrusted with the biggest job, but that doesn't mean that he has to do everything. Everyone knew what they were getting involved with. Good fighter or not, everyone showed their different strengths and singularities, and it was truly enjoyable to watch. Some of my favorite fights ever. Meanwhile, of course, a lot was happening at the same time at the palace. And finally we learned what was Crocodile's objective all along. He is after a legendary weapon called Pluton, that is said to be somewhere in this kingdom. Like he said before, he wants military might to surpass the power of even the world government. Okay, he basically wants to conquer the world. Ambitious supervillain. He's also planning on blowing up the rebels and the royal army that are fighting in the front square with a cannonball in 30 minutes. Why? Because they're all inconsequential, obviously. And he also has one last question. Where is the Poneglyph? The what now? The king agrees to show him whatever this is. And surprise, surprise, look who decided to show up at the reunion. I feel sorry for him. He just realized how stupid he's been. Dude, they are so mean. Straight up telling him that he has been a puppet this whole time. I just love how Crocodile just calmly insults everyone every two seconds, in the most classy way possible. Like, yes, you magnificent fool. Okay, now they have one last chance now that Kaza knows the truth, to surrender and make everyone stop. But oh my god, the same thing again. Like, we ever thought this was actually gonna stop here. But Vivi still has hope. Look, respect for her too. She's kind of powerless and never does accomplish anything. But like, give her a break. She tries so hard. But Crocodile just wants to destroy every single drop of optimism in her. But Vivi will never yield, even with all the cruel words she had to take from him. And obviously this is what makes the next scene so freaking epic. Just in time, Luffy. What a way to make a comeback. Vivi is desperately telling him that no one can hear her please. But he simply replies, I can hear your voice. How do you do it? Luffy, why are you like this? And they all got reunited at the square. Nami, how can you be like that? She made Zoro, who's clearly in worse shape than she is, carry her all the way here, and then she hit Usopp, who has no part left of his body unhurt, just because of everything she had to go through with the weapon. But look at them all together. I love this so much. My heart is happy again. Now they have 10 minutes left to stop the explosion. And this is it. We cannot take more twists than this. Usopp imitating Crocodile though, with his all bandaged body, was even funnier. He was trying to think, if I were Crocodile, where would I put a bomb? Bibi figured it out, and why is she always grabbing Usopp by the nose? I think it's like the third time I see her doing this. Although, they kind of all do it. Time to get everyone back at the center. And what would we do without Usopp, really? Now that they know the bomb is inside the clock tower, they have like 30 seconds to act. Just with a little bit of teamwork, and I just love how in sync they are. Seven seconds, do something. Yes, we're all thinking the same. And Vivi made it to the top. Oh my god, and her attack was effective. Yay, finally. And she stopped it. But it has a timer. Of course it has a timer. So it's gonna explode anyways. On the other side, the real Luffy vs. Crocodile fight has begun. And I can't express how satisfactory that first punch was. Like, no one has been able to make a single scratch on him, and seeing someone finally hurt him was truly rewarding. You're afraid of water, Sandy Man. Luffy's a fast learner when it comes to battles. And now that he has figured out the Croc's weakness, he knows he can win. Miss All Sunday each time is more captivated by him. She's having the best time watching them fight. But she doesn't have the time for this and took the chance to order Cobra to take her to this thing called the Poneglyph. 
Crocodile's patience is also gone, and he started to dry everything in his way, so he can turn anything into sand. That's crazy. On the way to this mysterious thing, we learn that Nico Robin has had a reward of 79 million berries since she was 8 years old, and she was accused of sinking 6 marine vessels so the government declared her a top-level public menace. But she disappeared and no one has seen her since. That's why she didn't want to be called by her real name. And she's really starting to lose her composure here, first time seeing her like that. But her powers are impressive, she can turn a sword back at its owner in a heartbeat. It's time to go to the Royal Mausoleum. So this is what the Poneglyph is, a national secret that it's not meant to be shown to anyone. I think I could never have imagined it looked like this. Apparently, Nico Robin has the ability to read them, and this is why Crocodile teamed up with her and couldn't kill her. So it makes sense now that she was doing whatever she wanted without being afraid of being disposed. Not even the king knows what's written in there. All he knows is that generations of kings had been entrusted with protecting this thing. But Robin wouldn't call it protect. We are adding more mysteries and I love it. Crocodile believes the location of the weapon he's after is what's written in there. Robin told him that there's nothing about Pluton and there is just some history of the kingdom. Is it though? Hearing this, Crocodile says, that's too bad. But, well, guess I don't need you anymore then. Fair enough. And now all the impressive skills she has shown so far in terms of fighting are no use against him. And he said that based on Cobra's reaction before, he knows the Pluton exists and he's gonna get his hands on it no matter what. Okay, he's kinda cuckoo right now. And where is Luffy? The look on Crocodile's face when he sees him again. Like, why won't you die? I keep killing you and you keep coming back. It's nice to see him suffer too. Crocodile keeps questioning Luffy as why he's doing all this. Why get involved so much for the sake of someone else, to even die for it? Luffy's reply is very simple. He's helping Vivi because she's his friend and doesn't want her to die. Because she's the kind of person that doesn't want people to get killed, but she's always risking her life herself. And as long as she keeps fighting, so will they. I love the contrast of these words with the other party doing the impossible to get to that clock tower. While he keeps trying to beat Luffy with words, especially after hearing he wants to become king of the pirates, telling him that's just an upstart with delusion of grandeur, like a thousand others, and that the more you know about the sea, the more impossible that dream will seem. Luffy's not even listening. He has one thought in his head. I will defeat you. At the same time, a great sacrifice was about to be made. Pale decided to take the bomb with him, and this hit harder than I thought. Because they decided to show us some of his beautiful memories with Vivi and his love for her and the kingdom. And for Vivi to have to see him die in front of her eyes just hit right in the feels. But even after that incredible sacrifice, people just won't stop fighting. This is breaking my heart. Like, I can't see Vivi suffer anymore. Like, somebody do something. Luffy, with his strength coming out of pure will, didn't stop until finally he sent the mighty warlord of the sea, Sir Crocodile, flying to the same skies his bomb disappeared moments ago. Vivi having first class seeds to see the feet. It's over. It's finally over. Or is it? For the love of God, people, stop fighting. There's only one thing that can put an end to this. The blissful rain. Rain is the best. Making Vivi's voice finally reachable, with Igaram ultimately being able to clear the misunderstanding and ending this nightmare for good. Oh my god, what a ride. The Straw Hats are absolutely beaten. They can't even make it on their own to the palace and end up passing out in the streets. Totally understandable. I also want to address the Navy's role in this whole situation. After this arc, I ended up really liking Tashi as well. She and Smoker are trying to follow their ideals. That's why they probably joined the Navy in the first place. To catch criminals and bring justice to this world, right? But it's really hard to do that when everything is so corrupted. First, the Navy making allies with people like Crocodile and the whole Warlords of the Seas thing clearly doesn't follow what they both think the Navy as an institution should be and represent. Tashiki in this case was forced to make a hard decision, to follow the rules or to follow what she believed was right. When she confronted Robin and Crocodile, she realized how weak she is. She wants to bring justice, but to do that, you have to earn the right to do so. If you're not strong enough to do it by yourself, you can't get in the way of the people who actually can, even if those people are pirates. So she put away her Navy Sergeant label and helped the situation by telling Luffy where Crocodile 
Noah's, guiding the Straw Hats to the square to stop the explosion, and she forbade the capture of them when they were unable to move after everything they did. Oh my appreciation. She reported to Smoker all of this, of course, and he didn't seem surprised at all, like he would have probably been disappointed if she hadn't done that. But he told her not to let her frustration win, and if she wants to do something about it in the future, she has to get stronger. They are a weird but fitting team, and they are my favorite marines. They also get informed that the navy wants to promote both of them for defeating Crocodile, and they are also going to be awarded medals, which absolutely infuriated Smoker, and just told them to shove off. See? Love him. The navy sucks. Finally, it's rest and celebration time. It's always one of my favorite parts from every arc. Vi just watching the rain while everyone is sleeping is really soothing after everything that happened. I really enjoyed seeing a little bit of peace in the palace with Vivi and the rest doing their own things before they decided it was time to part. And she did fulfill her promise to Luffy and gave them an amazing feast to even begin to thank them for saving her people and home. And thanks to ex mister Two Bon Clay, the Navy did not get their hands on the Mary. So they are going to get their ship back and go to the east port at 12 noon tomorrow and if Vivi decides she wants to go with them and be a pirate she has to show up there but ultimately it's her decision. And now it's Captain Black Cage Hina, Smoker's old friend, who's going after them. This lady that talks in third person has the ability to bind people with iron shackles kind of really handy for a marine. Bon Clay tells them that she is bad news all right and they need to get out of here quickly. But they tell him they can't because they need to pick up a friend first. And hearing this, Bon Clay made an unexpected decision. What is up with this guy and friendship? Why is it so important to him? I'm really curious, like to the point of sacrificing himself for them. I really don't get what touched him so much. Usually they make small gestures for people so they end up wanting to help them, but in this case they didn't do anything that special for him. So that's why I'm confused. Is it because Sanji spared his life? Or simply because they treated him like a friend when they met? Or because he was inspired by their devotion towards one of their friends and feels touched by the beauty of friendship itself? Whatever it was, thank you Bonchan, we won't forget you. Vivi's decision is one of the hardest parts of this arc to watch. Especially when she's alone in the room with Karu, thinking it's really quiet now, being just the two of them. Or when she was saying to Nami that the world is a big place, there are giants and dinosaurs and cherry blossoms blooming in a snowy land, and lots of unimagined wonders waiting to be discovered and her speech about her adventures and the group of pirates she met, with all of them waiting for her to appear, and that final moment when she gets there, but only to say goodbye. I can't do this. I'm almost crying. She can't go with them. She would love to continue their adventures together, but when it comes down to it, she loves her kingdom, so she's gonna stay here. But if we ever see each other again, will you call me your shipmate? Oh god, every time. Every time I see this, I'm such a mess. Needless to say, it's one of my favorite moments ever. She will always be an official straw hat. And yes, I cried here during this scene when I first watched it. This is just too emotional and beautiful. Her decision makes sense though, like after everything she did. Imagine if she were like, oh, what a mess. Okay, good luck then, I'm gonna go be a pirate. Take care of everything, bye. But now, finally with the kingdom at peace, it's time to put an end to the Alabasta arc. Bye bye Vivi, I hope to see you again. Before finishing, one thing that was left kind of unexplained though, is how on earth did these two survive? Like, Igaran just showed up out of nowhere and no one questioned why was he alive. My only theory is that Robin had something to do with it and she never intended to kill him, so I'm okay with that. But Pell being alive, I feel like it doesn't seem right. Like, what was the point of the whole sacrifice? It was a really touching moment and he died like a hero for the country he loved. And it made sense for Vivi to actually have to go through someone's death. But now it takes all of the significance away. Like, what was the point of emphasizing during the whole arc that people are gonna die? It was a perfect case in point. 
well, regardless, this arc is truly amazing for me. I think it represents everything that I like about One Piece, especially in the sense of fellowship and that everyone has a role to play in this story. And everyone on their ship is irreplaceable. I don't want to compare it to future arcs just yet, but I feel like this arc has everything. A good antagonist, good character development fights, peak moments, plot twists, the beginning of a lot of mysteries, unpredictable situations. Like I mentioned before, I never know what's going to happen and that's what keeps it entertaining and engaging all the time. Not to mention the comedy. This arc is in my top five, definitely. And I think it has a lot to do with the point in the story we're currently at that makes it more special. And it has to do with the simplicity of it, which I will address more in the future. Next time, we will continue with the Jaya arc, setting the premise for a new adventure in one of the craziest places yet to discover. If you are new to these reviews, you can check all the other ones in this playlist over here, and you can subscribe to get notifications as soon as the newest one is available. Thank you for watching and see you in the next one.